I clicked it at the wrong time. Welcome to the <laughs> podcast, Internet. We're trying out a whole new thing tonight, and I'm not going to figure it out the first try. Uh, this is Joe, your host for the Hangout Trial Podcast. And who's with me tonight? Uh, Chris and Adam. Hi, guys. Are you guys drinking things? Yes. Um, I was drinking my water, and I just got it from downstairs, and then I decided that it tastes funny. I'm not sure why, so I'm not drinking anything. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. What are you drinking, Chris? Oh, I'm I'm being real basic tonight. I just got a hard strawberry lemonade. Um, just just enjoying a uh, little bit of something tasty after puppy classes. <laughs> I'm I'm with there. Uh, I am drinking the New Belgium sparkling lime lager, and, and I'm not normally a lager guy, but man, this stuff's good. It's yeah. so good. I can feel that. That so, that that does sound pretty tasty right now. <laughs> yeah, I can only find it in their like twelve pack variety pack, so I only get three, and yep. I really want more of it. So, yeah. Anyway. We're trying out a whole new uh, recording tool tonight, so this is just kind of a goof-off podcast to test that. Uh, it's called Zencaster, and hopefully it makes it so we have to do less work and we can record more things. That's always good. Yeah. I mean, that's That's been the biggest hurdle right now, is like everybody just feels drained, and putting more things on the plate is just almost out of the question. Um and that's like I I know I'm the one saying this, and I'm the one who does the least editing of the audio on the podcast. Um, like I normally gravitate towards doing the live stream stuff and doing like recorded video and stuff like that. That's that's more of my wheelhouse. But like, and we have things for that coming. We do. And we at least we have do. projects we're talking about that we're talking really seriously about, and we do have a live stream coming on October 10th. Yes, nice. which we can we can announce. We actually do have graphics for, um, so those will be released soon. I'm actually really kind of proud of those graphics. I'm really excited for people to be able to see them. They look kind of cool. Um, They're so awesome, so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's uh, I I don't know, man. I've been I've been back on my cyberpunk, my vaporwave all over again, and uh, back um, that went I'm, away. Man, it like it it kind of like ebb and waved, and I was like, all right. And now all I'm listening to is is vaporwave all over again. I'm like, all right, cool, <laughs> nice. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah, so we're we're doing Verf after dark, and then um, we're gonna do. Do you want to just announce it so we can start getting input? Yeah, let's let's go ahead because um, okay. we we're planning on um, announcing it hopefully next week. So. Uh, we have a cool project that's coming up um, that we're going to be doing uh, a one-off video of, um, and hopefully, if things go well, um, we'll be able to do more of them. Um, but right now, we are planning to do one. Um, so I am I am setting the expectations. Um, we will <laughs> we will see how it goes after this. We are excited to do more. Um, we would think it would be a really cool opportunity to do more, but I will let Joe talk a little bit more about what that is. Okay. So, um, I have been working with some people to get more useful information in existence on the E3D tool changer. And, um, so what Chris and I are going to do is we're going to do a like Q and a video. Uh, where you guys send us your questions uh, the, the stupider the better the simpler the better uh, the legitimate things you've been wondering on using the tool changer how it works how I utilize mine um, and those types of things and we're just going to record like a 20-30 minute video and answer the questions and try to answer not, not super deep down technical detail but like the high level um, just kind of clearing the air and, and having a conversation type of thing. And then yeah. we'll see where that goes from there. It's, it's, it's a really cool opportunity. Um, we were, we're getting helpful input from the E3D guys um, and them 
kind of guiding us as well um, with some of the input, which is really awesome um, that they're, they're kind of behind us on this and want us to, want us to help get better information out there um, and more clear and concise information about what tool changer is, how it functions, what, what are the real applications you should be putting it towards? It's not just a multicolored printer. It's so much more. Um, and so getting getting stuff like that out to the public to be able to have better decisions before they go in. And, and, and that's kind of been all the stuff that we've heard from everybody when we've talked to, when we've talked to people is um, just creating a better buying experience for that. So the expectations are not set wrong um yeah. and so that's what we want to help with we want to we want to create something cool for you guys to be able to uh send your friends who might be interested or if you might be interested uh hopefully this will help your buying decision um so yeah so hopefully we're going to be recording that in the next um week or two um and then it'll go into editing and we'll have something released shortly after that um, no timeline right now. I'm going to try and pump it out as quickly as possible, but, uh, that is, that is what we are currently looking at. So look at, be look at you managing that. expectations properly. I was going to give a timeline. Oh no, <laughs> no. I, I, I got work again. I like, <laughs> they're flying me out to not flying me out. They're forcing me down to Louisville and I'm going to be no. down there for a week. So uh, no, yeah. I'm not really excited for that one. Yeah. But how are you guys been? How how are how are how's your last? I, I, like Adam, we haven't seen you for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, since the last time I was on the podcast. Well, no, I was on the um, the Ignite Peoria thing. Oh, you were. That's with right. Jason. Yeah. yeah. With yeah the, the light. Burn. Well, I would say I was there for the light burn stuff. It started out as like talking about it with me separately. And then of course, Joe put me and Jason together. Cause you know, I work for Jason and Lightburn, Right. So that ended yeah. up just being a great, like light burn lasers, hangout chat, which was fun. But, well, well, how have you been? What are you, I'm been, good. What are you been up I'm to? I'm good. I've, I've, I've got way too many projects to work on. Um, which is kind of weird. Cause it's like, I both shouldn't have more time than I normally do because of all the lockdown stuff, but I do. Cause like I was working from home full time anyways. Mm. I started that right before. And so I was like, Oh, nothing will really change. I have so much more time now. And I think it's just cause we don't go out. We don't go to the movies. We don't go to, you know, wherever every weekend, it's basically the same thing. Yep. Uh, you know, working on projects and stuff I've built, I've designed and built two plotters now since all this shit started. Um, I just finished the other one a couple of weeks ago, which was, which was fun, but yeah, it's, I I've caught that bug real hard and I'm, I've, I've already got like numbers three and four, like in the, in the planning plus, plus a full 3d printer rebuild that Joe, that I've been talking Joe's ear, ear off about lately. Um, this piece of crap form bot behind me that I hate. So you say form bot. Yeah. You guys are sitting next to the same printers. I that's I was like I'm pretty okay. sure. I was yeah. like that that looks a lot like this big mess right over here. Yeah, I, so oh god. Um I had when when I first got into 3D printing I had a MakerBot replicator too. So like that was my my first introduction to it. And that was just eventually was obviously well it was terrible from the beginning, but eventually it was really really terrible and I wanted to upgrade. And I ended up buying this one, I don't know what, three years ago, something like that. It was a the T Rex two plus or whatever. Okay. Um, which at the time, like it looked like it had relatively good specs. It was decent for the money, but it's one of those things where like I've always had problems with it. It it's always been good but not great. Right. And then um I upgraded it to the three when they came out with that, which was also a fun thing because I had been sort of on their like Facebook communities and stuff. And when I got it, they had 3d printed components on it that were like clearly just mine, my mods. So that, that was a fun <laughs> conversation with them. Um, Cause I had made a bunch of mods to like improve the, the cooling ducts, improve the tensioning on the X belts. Cause it was terrible. 
um, and a bunch of other things like that. And they had just done it, but the, and the upgrade process was terrible for a lot of reasons. Cause like some of the cables didn't reach and stuff like that. It was just, it was bad. Um, but so then I bought after having built with two other friends, a Prusa Mark three, I finally was like, screw it. I'm, I'm getting a Mark three. So I bought that. That became kind of more of my, my, my main printer. And then, then I was at Earth and I bought a mini and then I bought another Mark three and then I bought another mini and then this one. And then I got the, the, um, Daedalus, which Joe also has, which is amazing. Um, so the form bot kind of got relegated to the corner of my office for a long time and I was going to sell it, but then pandemic and like, it's not the kind of thing I can easily ship. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to like go and meet some random person. Right. So finally, after a while and just sort of learning more and more over the last year or so, I was like, screw it. I'm ripping it apart. Cause the, the one of the major problems I always had was Z banding where like, there would just be these like striations every five millimeters, which was the same pitch as the, the lead screws. And I, I did all sorts of things. I could never get rid of it. And finally I was like, screw it. I'm replacing the, I'm replacing the screws. I'm, or actually they're ball screws, not lead screws technically, but, um, I'm replacing the screws. I'm redesigning the X axis. So I've been going down that road. I'm going to do basically a duet swap on it because I'm sick of the controller. Ah. So, yeah. I mean, if you're going to do the duet swap, maybe I'll just wait then. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which model is yours? So mine is the, uh, T-Rex three, um, the 700, um, oh, so the the tall boy, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So the one thing I, is yours, Idex. Yes, yes. Okay. So the one thing I will say is I am ignoring Idex. I I'm only putting one extruder on it. Mo- That's for. I just don't care enough. Yeah. Um, the way that I always used it was weird. I had it set up with a a zero point six millimeter nozzle and a one point two millimeter nozzle, and I used it as basically two printers. Yeah. So I want to print faster or i want to print oh my god i need it done now and i don't care what it looks like and i would just you know just i could just choose a different profile and it would print with that i never printed multi-material multi-color anything like that so it's like you know i and at this point i have six printers plus i think that's sick i can't keep track anymore um so i didn't really need the the dual nozzles on it so i'm just like screw it i'm just putting one i got i got a Hamera went like right when they were finally available on retail i i bought it purely because i knew it was going to sell out and i just wanted it just in case maybe i was going to stick it on the Daedalus. not sure so instead i I decided to put it on this thing um and and actually when i say do i swap i i'm lying a little bit it's the panic kit something or other the one that's like meant to be a it's a rep rep firmware drop and replacement for the enders it's like eight okay because g2 or something yeah, yeah, yeah the connects or something yeah. yeah connect g2 something like that i i thought about getting one of the they, they were out of the maestros i couldn't find any of those and then the only way up from there was to go to like maybe a duet two which was kind of pushing it for what i wanted to spend on it when I, really i could use the original controller i just didn't want to for a variety of reasons mostly just because like the only way to connect to it is with the stupid uh vga cables that they use and i didn't want to use those anymore so oh okay what i just i i i like those stupid vga cables simply because like it's a really clean wiring solution but it's also like kind of terrible yeah Uh, it it, it's good in this bad like i also wanted this to be the kind of thing where if i want to swap it out for some other hot end i can just do that and i don't care about it i want this to be kind of a tinkering machine and the VGA cables make it a pain because it's like, I've actually, I, on, well, and this was one of the other things that they had kind of copied um, from the two plus to the three, I had designed a modified version of the PCB that the VGA cables hook up to with better connectors and a different, slightly different layout and stuff. Um, so I've done that. I can do it, but I just didn't want to have to like do that every time. I, I'd, I'd rather just have a wire bundle that I can hook up to however I want. Right. Um, I, there was just my preference for this particular thing right now, which meant going with a full controller. Cause like the only outputs to that controller are those two VGA outputs and that's all you've got. So yeah, 
I, I like the ability to have like screw terminals and specific things that I can connect to. See, I thought that was a standard MKS board or something like that. No, it's not. Um, at least I don't think so. It's like literally sitting right behind me. Um, it, yeah, it just says Vive Dino 1.1. I mean, it's a completely custom board. It's it's oh. got it's got a forty pin like IDE cable coming out the bottom that hooks up to all the other shit. So that's one of the other things. The only connections into this are two VGA ports out and then a forty pin like dual row IDE type connector, and that's it. Okay, that, that's my same problem with the BCN Sigma boards. Is the only way to connect to them is ribbon cables, right? And 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 that's. That's fine for mass manufacturing, and that's great. But for me, I, I want to be able to have individual connectors to plug yeah. into it. Like, I totally get that in the aspect of manufacturing a device for sale. But oh, yeah, totally. it doesn't make any sense for a machine that I'm going to play around with. So, yeah, that's why I started digging into Clipper for that thing. So I could keep the stock board and still oh, do all the Okay, so just, yeah, leave all this stuff. But see, but at this point, too, I was already planning on completely replacing the X-axis, completely replacing the Z-axis, putting a different uh, bed leveling sensor on there. So I'm swapping, I swapped out the BL Touch, I'm going to put an easy ABL on it. Um, but, I mean, you can yep. put whatever, you know, on there. I did, I wanted a contactless one because um, yeah. I like I like how it works on the Daedalus. It's nice. Um, so yeah, that, I just... That's what I'm doing on the Sigma, too. There's an easy ABL and... Yeah. yeah. Although, you know, f- funny thing about that, I had, uh, I was trying to look at the documentation for that. I need to talk to Tim about this. And three times in a row, the PDF documentation crashed Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> like, just straight up, it would crash. And even, I had to open it in Edge. In like, no, oh, yeah. And then, then it didn't crash, but it was god-awful slow. Like, I'd go to search for something, because I was trying to find what while I was doing the CAD, I was trying to find what the offset from the nozzle tip to the the, the bottom of the sensor should be. Okay. You know, I, I kind of had an assumption, but I didn't know. I wanted to look at the docs. And I was trying to search for, like, Z offset, whatever, and it was just crawling. So, like, I don't know if he had a Bitcoin miner in the PDF or <laughs> what, <laughs> but it, it was doing something. You know, it was just ridiculous. I- I can tell you that the number that the PDF gives uh, has a much bigger window than what the PDF says. Oh, like what? What's actually possible? Yes. Yeah. For the it, for the pro, for the pro or like the larger one, it said two millimeters, but I I'm assuming it can be more than that. Yeah, I, I have for the the pro the smaller one. It's supposed to be a millimeter, and on the Daedalus, uh, I have it at like six. Oh wow! So and. Uh, Tim told me that was perfectly fine. Basically, if it triggers, it's fine. Yeah, um, yeah, and I saw yeah all the stuff about yeah adjusting the sensitivity and all that all that fun stuff. And yeah, like I was doing for for Joe the other day, other Joe, not this Joe, um, test with the the probe test on it, and it was like within point zero zero one millimeters mean deviation from at, you know from the average or whatever. So yeah, yeah, it's not going to be bad. I I think I did the CAD so that it can be up to like 10 millimeters away something like that um I, you know i figured I'll, I'll hold on to the sensor further up if i need to i just whatever but yeah i'm, I'm still playing with that so that's kind of the, my latest cad project um yeah i'm keeping busy i always Fair have stuff enough. to do constant stream of packages coming in from printed solid and mauser and digikey and all those things Speaking of which, yes, I found out where the mystery package came from. Oh, so for for context, uh-huh. all of a sudden, a package of filament just showed up on my doorstep. It's Christmas. You would think, filament and I was Santa, just, but it was using my my name I go by kind of in public now. And not my actual name where I like that I actually use to ship everything. Okay. So like I, I kind of have a name that I go by that I'm going to be switching to. Um, I'm getting my last name changed. Oh, okay. um, and so I've started to go to that pretty much everywhere else. But I still like in order for payment stuff, I still use my my actual name. Yeah. So that way, like it gets shipped correctly and whatnot. 
So all of a sudden, this package showed up with that name on it at my address, and I had never talked to that company at all. Um, to the point of where like Joe had um been in talks with them about potentially getting one of the filament colors named after the podcast. So we're like, well, maybe it's that. Maybe they were sending a test one. But I was like, but how did they figure out my name? Like, this part's really weird to me. <laughs> um, and by, so, by the way, in, in talks and trolling in the comment section when they were asking for names, those are different things. Oh, uh, one, okay. one of them I, I, I did. Legitimately. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so <laughs> then like... Um, I'm like trying to figure this out. I'm like talking to Joe. I'm talking to like everybody. Like I'm appreciative, but like, where did this come from? <laughs> I finally get a text from a teacher who I had um, set up with a Prusa mini. Um, mm. Their classroom had an old uh, Sigma ripoff. That was a, oh, or it was an XYZ. That's what it was um it was a piece of shit um thing barely ran it had the proprietary filament where it had a qr code scan on on it um and it was just it was just shitty and i was like and he the main reason he asked me was like hey can you come in and take a look at this i'm having problems and so i literally looked at it and i go i i will take that off your hands the amount you're gonna ask me to help you fix this i will buy you a better printer and so i bought him a perusa mini and I was like, this will do you way better. It already has better print space than you, than that one does it anyways, too. Um, and so I bought that for him and everything. And then he messaged me out of the blue. He goes, hey, just checking. Did you get the filament that we sent you? And I was like, oh, okay. There this makes complete sense. <laughs> he goes, yeah, no, we just wanted to say thank you. And we wanted Amazing. to send you filament. <laughs> just happened to be from that company you were talking to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the color. So oh really? it, wow yeah okay. was, so 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 what color is Makers on Tap fil- filament? Uh, it is Christmas green. Um, is the is the green that we were like near? Um, gotcha. kind of like a neon. It, the, the 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 label on there is Christmas green. It's kind of between like a neon green and a in a evergreen green. Um, but it is green. <laughs> but. Yeah, no, they got it for me because it's Mossville Green, which is Mossville is one of the the elementary school where it lives at. Um, and so now I have to print something badass with that green so I can actually have that on display. How's it printed for you? I haven't done it yet because um, I was having issues with one of the printers and I can't remember what. And then I started working again. <laughs> ah, What's the yeah. company that it's from? 3d fuel yeah 3d oh, fuel. okay gotcha i still haven't tried any of their stuff yet everything i've printed from them i've liked okay cool so it, it, probably i just haven't because i already have too much film that i need to go through um the main one that i really like from them is their pro soluble support mm-hmm. um it's nowhere near as hydroscopic as that, the others that i've used and uh it snaps away really cleanly and it washes away nicely nice. so that's um, the glasses I was printing with soluble support at Earth last year was with. Oh, okay, yeah, gotcha. That's cool. So, yeah, it's good stuff. That's awesome. Fuck yeah. Hey, I've, yeah, I've gotten some weird packages that I didn't know, remember ordering or didn't know what they were, but they've never been things cool like filament. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was super appreciative, but at the same time, I was like, I'm a little skeptical right now because this is a very specific thing that like. Obviously, my friends know about me, but some random person probably doesn't know that I have like four 3D printers down in my basement. <laughs> yeah, I, I even really I, I even messaged uh, John, the owner of the company on Facebook. And I was like, did you send us a present? And he was like, no, but I'm not saying that the company didn't, you know, have fun. Enjoy your product. <laughs> it's like, OK, <laughs> Um thanks regardless uh right. so yeah that's awesome <laughs> so um yeah sorry my my side story aside joe what no, have you been fine. up to man trying to stay sane um 
I've caught up on most of my big stuff. I finally got to make a project with the big CNC. Nice. That, that's Besides the update the that desk? I should give. Yes. I, uh, this was the first big project that I've done since the rack and pinion upgrade. I okay. did a, a small project that was gear and it was gear shaped and it came out really good. Uh, but I, I did, um, tool storage and the Stanley organizers. Uh, I built storage racks for those and uh, everything came out phenomenally. And I was just, it, it was awesome. I, last weekend I had a, a whole day and I was just like, you know what? Today's the day I've had wood sitting around for all this forever. So I cut out a full four by eight sheet of dividers, uh, quarter inch dividers and you know, doing single pass with an eighth inch compression bit and quarter inch plywood at a hundred inches a minute is so satisfying. I, my router is now faster than my laser for cutting quarter inch plywood. And it's, that's ridiculous. It's Fair incredible. <laughs> See, that's like, that reminds me of like, Joe, I think I told you about this one time. It was when I built the giant plotter that I kind of wanted to build like, a router that was specifically meant only for doing quarter inch, like really thin quarter inch material. Basically one yeah. that had like very little Z, you know, cause a lot of them, they'll still have like, you know, six or eight inches of Z, but something that was meant for basically just doing that, like stuff that you can't process with a laser. Cause like, I think you were cutting those, the Stanley stuff out of like OSB, right? Yeah. Which is just terrible in a laser. It's not going to go through it. There's too much glue and shit and yeah, whatever. Not... But it'd be amazing to have a machine that's like, which granted at that point, just build a, freaking router but i don't know it's i have weird ideas yeah don't always yeah, make I, sense i i'm with you um yeah that it was really fun to just like slam through those as fast as i could i know i could have gone faster too like that was the thing is these were cutting so good it's like i should go faster so, isn't, isn't uh, that, i should finish the project <laughs> isn't it fun when you build a machine and then it goes faster than you even you thought that it could yes that's like I think I was telling you, Joe, about the the most recent plotter, and that one's you know the oh, super lightweight. Yeah. It's all Core XY, and I actually designed it for a friend of mine who is just getting into the plotter stuff, and he was kind of complaining about everything that he found was like really small or whatever. And I've got him using Lightburn for it, and he apparently just jumped right in, and I hadn't even tried it at, at this point yet, and just started using the default settings in Lightburn, which are for lasers. And the default setting is 100 millimeters per second. So this thing's just flying around. And then I was like, I looked at that. I was like, let me see how fast I can get this going. And I had it up to, I don't know, 230, 240 millimeters a second. Like actually drawing with a pen. I've never seen an actual pen plotter go that fast. That is it, crazy. Yeah. It, it's just stupid because I've also, I'm not sure I've ever actually seen a pen plotter that someone made that was Core XY for no. whatever reason like they're like a lot of times they're normally like that like axidraw style where it's like a, a you know a, a t-bot or whatever which yeah. obviously can't go fast at all um you know that they're limited to it but i was pleased with myself particularly with that one because i think i was kind of going after the like axidraw max you know whatever their 800 dollars one size which can do a full 11, 11 by 17 and i think the bomb on mine is 290 something like oh that. wow don't tell me Jeez. things like that. I don't need another project. <laughs> yeah, no, exa ex exactly. Yeah, I, and speaking of other projects, I finally like sat down and started really hammering hard on my little baby CNC router project that I've been yes. working on for a long time. Yes. Um, have I even told you about that, Chris? I I don't think so. I've like purposely left you two out of it because I, I take on so much stuff and I know you guys get annoyed with it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say annoyed uh, with it is the word. I would say keep you in check and focused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, uh, this this project never had a it never had a date and it never really had an end goal other than like I wanted to build it. So it's called the milk crate. And uh okay. It's it's milk crate size. It's 500 by 500ish footprint millimeter and uh cuts nine inch by 12 inches um and it's really targeting the audience for that other machine that just came out um at less than a quarter of the price uh so but it, you know it will use a uh a makita router 
Um, so same RPM range, but louder. Um, I thought you were talking about the 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 Shepoko like that's a Makita router. Oh, yeah, that is Makita. It, okay, it, it's a Makita clone that's like forty dollars cheaper because it doesn't come with all the extra stuff. Yeah. So yeah, gotcha. Um, so yeah, the Carbide 3D r- router thing. And, oh, that's um, what, yeah, Carbide 3D. I couldn't remember which one it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it's based off of steel tubing and linear rails. It's very print NC inspired, uh, but built in a box. So we'll see. I, I'm excited. I'm going to build one. I took last weekend off of doing everybody else's work and like really hammered down on the design and got it probably 60% of the way there. Um, started printing fit up parts this week and the fit, fit up parts are like, so hell uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty stoked about it. Basically the idea is if you have a table saw and a Prusa mini or Ender three sized printer, you should be able to create this thing. So, all right. I mean, that's a like, that's pretty exciting because I have a project coming up that I need your CNC assistance for. Um, oh, yeah. Sure. So, that might be a fun one to play with that for. Is it big or a little? I mean, I have, it's I have big little rails. on a big surface. Okay, I don't, I don't, I don't get it, but okay. <laughs> so we're redoing the table in the living room. Um, mm-hmm. I really don't like the table. Table looks like shit, and Laura doesn't like the table. Table looks like shit. Um, and it's got glue and shit all over it. They got it for free. Um, it was just like sitting outside. Um like somebody's house. And so they picked it up because they needed it because it was for their, their first apartment. So now we want to sand down the shit out of it and restain it, take the legs that are on it off of it and put, uh, uh, cast iron hinge legs, um, and have it look a little bit more industrial modern. Um, but the real big thing that I want to do to make it different from like before, is I want to uh, carve out a D20 on the inside and then uh, pour epoxy in there with some LEDs and have the epoxy be like a nice kind of like blue tone against some darker tones and then also have like a uh, LED lights in there so I can turn them on whenever. Um, so yeah, design it. Let's let's do that. It sounds like you need one of those uh, Shaper Origin things so you can have a, you know, router yeah. on an open surface. That'd be cool, but we can fit that tabletop on a router, so it's fine. <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's one of the next projects that I'm really excited about is just doing that at some point. <laughs> that sounds like a good winter project. Probably. I want to get it done before Thanksgiving, potentially, because um, Laura's family might be coming for uh, Thanksgiving. So, nothing like family driven deadlines <laughs> for real, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this, this year is really weird for me because I'm used to always having like, okay, Maker Fair's coming up, and then this, and then this. And like, I've always got like three or four events throughout the year that I'm trying to finish projects for. Yeah. Um, and you know, we'll be like, okay, I got three months to finish this, and then and this year it's just been open, which has actually been nicer than I expected it to be. So it's been it's been a blessing and a curse. Yeah. Because I'm totally. the same way. Um a lot of the stuff that uh I create is is very much con focused. So I have like uh ASIN in the beginning, along with C2E2, uh, and then we have some of the later cons like Peoria Con, and we have some stuff that we do for the city of Peoria as well. Um, we march in parades and stuff like that. So it's been a blessing because we've had all this time to be able to build bigger and better costumes for next year. At the same time, we've had all this time. And it just doesn't feel like it has a deadline. 
And so it's just been kind of getting backburnered and backburnered and backburnered. And so I can't really say that there's been real big progress. The one that like I'm finally getting pushed on is to finish my Mando rifle. Um, I finally printed off like an entire uh, Mando rifle and we're going to try and have it done before Halloween so we can do um, pictures with the pup um, because we we got a corgi. um, So he has massive ears. Um, so having him look like baby Yoda is almost awesome. necessary. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Yeah. I, I get what you mean. I have a friend that goes to dragon con every year has for, I don't know, forever. And he's really super big into cosplay. Like it's the entire reason he got a 3d printer. Like that's his only thing, which I always find funny. Cause I'm like, I don't personally understand that. Cause I only do like mechanical parts. And then he'll ask me how to print something organic. And I'm like, I don't I use don't supports. Know. What's wrong with you? Like, <laughs> that's, that's not a thing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It was funny. I was talking to him about it and he was like, yeah, I'm not really motivated to do any of the stuff that I was going to work on because there's no deadline for it. I was like, or you could do a bunch now. And then next year, we hope if he gets to go back, then you'll have even more costumes to do. He's like, no, that's not how it works. I, ha- I have to do it all in the three weeks before the con. <laughs> It's, it's the only way it goes it's like okay fine whatever you do you con crunch man it's it's real yeah, totally like your, your friend and i'd get along well yeah. <laughs> oh i mean granted like you know for earth like i finished the engravenator stuff like right before i was coming you know where i you know was gonna have a table for all of that and i was just finally getting the last ones built and all that stuff it's like i get it but yeah i i'm gonna try to get one of the versions of the milk crate cutting for earth this year. Oh, we have, we have an exhibitor table and then we have verf after dark. Um, so like we actually have a, a slot to show off things and I want something to show off other than like, and by exhi- exhibitor table, you mean a time slot on a stream. Yeah, whatever. You know, you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Yeah. We, we have those things. Cause it's not like I've built a printer this year. I, I rebuilt the tool changer. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and at some point I'm going to get a symbol working, I think, you know, but as much as I want to make that work, cause I think it's really cool. Uh, there's a lot of complexity to it and I have a lot of other things I want to get done <laughs> at the <laughs> moment. That's fine. So I feel yeah. that. Man. Uh, it's been a crazy couple of weeks for the maker community, right? Like, um, do you want to get into that? <laughs> well, I want to go down that route only because, um, because so, I'm still clueless. <laughs> I never got your well, abridged. Oh, I well, I sent I sent you the the blog post. So yeah, Fusion no, I read through it. Changed their license for the personal use license and. If you really get into it, it's not that big of a deal for personal users. If you're really using it as a hobbyist, you don't need any of the things they're taking away. You don't. If you are using it as like an Etsy store that makes a little bit of money, you probably need the things that they're taking away. Or if you're using it as a consultant agency, you need a little bit of the things that they're taking away. You should probably pay the $300. That's my opinion. Um, so that that was the thing that I didn't see in the blog post was I didn't see the price that they were actually. So is it three hundred dollars a year or is it three hundred? It's normally four ninety five a year. It's on sale right now, which I don't know how long that's supposed to last. It's um, until the second week of October. Okay, so yeah, but it's not it's not long. Yeah, and and that sale's been going on since July. Oh, like okay. it, that's not that sale's not a new thing, and they run that sale all the time. Yeah, it sounds so, like the kind of thing where you just you wait until there's the next sale and whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. Or you can also get it for I think it was eight hundred a year. It was eight hundred one actually for three years. Oh um, wow! To, to lock it in at that, I I might have done that, but um, like it. That was one of those things where I ended up when when that came out, and actually my my business partner Dan from Maniacal Labs messaged me about it i th- yeah i think he was the first one that showed me that because there, there was a you know hackaday article about it or whatever and we got talking about it and 
we do actually use it for the business. And I hadn't even realized that when they changed the personal license, like I think there technically is still a startup option. Yeah. Which we sort of do, you know, we sort of qualify for, but I use the crap out of it. And like I was saying to Joe just earlier today, you know, I have some designs like they, they've got that 10 design limit, which is just like, you know, 10 files under a project. And I have some designs that there's like the main design and then there's 50 other sub designs that get imported into it. Yeah. And that's just the way that I work. Now, like if, if it's something that I designed from scratch, it's in the main thing as a sub component, but like, you know, a lot of times like with these plotters and stuff, it's like, Oh, well I, I need a GT2 22 pulley and I just grab it off a of grab cat or whatever, stick it on there. Um, so I'm just importing those and I leave those as separate sub designs. And I know that there's I, ways that I can clean that up, but I always break the references just because it slows the model down so much. That's fair. Yeah, I've been trying to do that more um, so that it doesn't have those those sort of back pointing references to everything. Yeah. Um, anyway, I didn't want to get too down in the weeds in this because we might have a future episode focusing completely on that, and I'm, that I'm trying to arrange. But um, what I did want to talk about was the search that I've been doing for the last year and before that for like the last seven years on free and accessible community CAD and cam or free. I should say free or accessible and accessible is thousand dollars or less. Um, so if you're making money on it, a thousand dollars for a perpetual license really should isn't that nothing. much. Um, and if you're not making money on it, a couple hundred dollars for a perpetual license really isn't that bad. When you take into account that commercial CAD can be $25,000 sometimes, like a seat of SolidWorks starts at five grand. And that depends on who you are and when, what kind of maintenance you want. I, it's five grand in the yearly maintenance. The maintenance is less or is more money than the yearly license for Fusion 360, which is not something I'm going to dive into anymore. But anyway... So I have this huge document that I've been compiling for the last year and a half of all these CAD systems. And I've been sending it around to people like, what am I missing? And uh, nobody has come back with anything yet. But I keep adding things, um, especially on the cam side. I found a whole bunch of really cool cam today. I'm excited to dive into the like, Gerbil Gru that I'd never heard of. Um, it's a free 3D simulated uh, Gerbil thing that uh does it does lathe cam and mill cam the lathe cam got me excited because there's like no free lathe cam out there and um it also does machine simulation kinematic simulation which is really damn neat uh and oh, it's actively cool. maintained and like, like he's making youtube videos up until like a week ago so it's an active project, which is also exciting because usually when I find these things the guy gave up on it like six years ago. And, and what did yeah, you see? I, I Fresh that. border ninety six. Um <laughs> <laughs> I had so. I had people at previous jobs that would always get confused, especially at Red Hat, when you know everything we were working on was open source, so we were always using a lot of open source projects. And I had a couple times where like my manager would come to me and be like, Hey, we should use this thing because it would really help our workflow or whatever. And I and I look at it and just go, Nope. And I'm like, Why? So the last commit was three years ago. Not touching it. Like, but it probably still works. Not touching it. <laughs> I, I, I will not touch it unless there's been a commit in the last six months. Yeah. Like, just not even going there. I want it to be actively maintained. Otherwise, it's dead. It's useless to me. But that was when we started this podcast. I was using a um, an audio cleaning software that I can't remember the name of right now, but it was made by the Conversation Network. And it was fantastic. And it ran on Windows only. And it hadn't, hadn't hadn't been updated in six years, but it worked, and it worked fantastic. And Aaron lost his mind. Uh, and it was yep. it, it it was the same kind of conversation where it was like, you know, this still works. And he's like, but the last commit was in two thousand seven, and they shut the project down. And you still installed that on your computer? And it's like I it I don't care. Whatever, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there is some like old software like that that unfortunately has gone by the wayside that still is good, but yeah. Oh, like oh, yeah. half 
half of the audio cleaning software that we are using is based off of that stuff you know from back in the day the sad part is they didn't open source it when they killed it they just like left it with the closed source and it and an exe and they're like here you go at so. least it's becoming more of a thing though like you see that a lot with like old games or old software where they're just like fine this is 25 years old here have the source code what's yeah. the worst that can happen well and that's what... Remember that one time when Photoshop gave everybody CS2 on accident? <laughs> <laughs> Although they did, I think, officially open source Photoshop 1.0. They did. I, I think the source yeah. of that came out a, a year or so ago. Yeah. I think, well, what's really cool, especially about games, is normally when they do that, it almost revitalizes that game. Oh, absolutely. Um, because like... there's now an entire subsection of gaming called randomizers um where what happens is so say you're playing like uh legend of zelda like the like uh either path between door or uh yeah path between door or worlds or um link's awakening or any of those yeah. um whenever you went to a chest it normally had an assigned item that popped out of that chest but what a randomizer does is it switches all the stuff around and so you now have to come up with a completely new path on how to get to the boss as quickly as possible right. um and so it took oh. this game that you played for so long and you knew that's where that is i gotta go get that now and you don't know anymore and it's well, that's different what all, that's every what a time. lot of those old games were always were anyways it was just memorization yeah, yeah. what's where that's the only way to beat them and that's it. Well, and so this gives you that fresh, that fresh outlook on it again. Is like, oh, I have to refigure out the game every yeah. time. Yeah. And yeah. so that's it. It's a very cool subsection of gaming that I love watching. Is any of the randomizers? Um, but yeah, no. It like when when people do cool stuff like that, it normally is only a positive, and it it just continues to revitalize those cool things that we all love. Um, and yeah. that's that's one of I, the best parts of it. <laughs> I like a year ago I was having a conversation with a friend of mine about how I feel like in a while we're going to end up with a situation that's kind of the same a little bit the same as TV from the 90s and I'll explain in that like with with video games where there'll be a bunch of video games that we all remember but we can't play anymore because the servers aren't there. Basically, because oh, there's a lot of them where they don't work without an internet connection and maybe someone can patch it or whatever to make it work. But there's so many games that are basically online only. And if you don't yeah. have that, you can't do anything. And it reminds me a little bit. I mean, not that there's TV shows that you can't get from the 90s, but there was that time period where they stopped using film and started using tape, but weren't using high quality digital. So like you can get star trek original series and tng in glorious 4k remaster but you can't get voyager on anything other than shitty dvd yep. because and don't mock voyager it's a wonderful show it was <laughs> it was it was amazing but it will never be on high def like no. there's some seasons of stargate that will never be on high def the later seasons Dude. are uh, but the earlier ones aren't because you can't remaster that it was nope. you know garbage. there's nothing to remaster it's on tape <laughs> yeah. because it's the resolution it was so it's just kind of like this weird state in time and i feel like video games are like basically video games right now are going to be that but well that's that's forward. already happening oh yeah totally. um they uh, especially so one of the biggest ones um that all you, you guys will definitely recognize was uh was halo um yeah, yeah. halo 3 the servers went offline i believe uh in i want to say uh 13 or 14 no maybe it's 14 um servers just went offline they just servers were done um and what sucked about that was there were certain achievements that were locked to online play and so if you hadn't gotten those achievements you just couldn't get them anymore. Um, and that happens every once in a while now, especially with like indie dev studios who were able to pay for servers for so long, but then, yep, we didn't make our money. We're now shutting down online support and you can't play anymore. 
Um, so it, it absolutely does happen, and that completely tanks the game. The biggest one, uh, this wasn't an online play function, but this was one of those things where having it online only sucked a ton, um, was there was a game that came out uh, about 10 years ago, actually 10 years ago exactly, um, called Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, the video game. Um, and it was such a fun fucking game. Uh, is an old school beat em up, much like you played your uh, Team NT, uh, played your original uh, X Men, but it was all styled in the Scott Pilgrim universe and had the Scott Pilgrim music. Um, That's fun. <laughs> oh, it's so much fun. What happened was it came out on Xbox Arcade, which was an indie stu- or indie like gaming thing that Xbox 360 did. Um, and what happened was that service got shut down. And so that game disappeared completely. It was no longer available. There was no physical releases of it. If you did, if you had it on your Xbox, you had to disconnect it from the internet and then you could still play it. And so there was Xboxes for sale for the longest time that just had it. And that was the only way you could play the game. But they finally announced literally last week that it was coming back and they were putting it on all the new consoles and there was going to be a physical release this time. Uh, so it like having stuff online like sucks, but at the same time, it's also like great, but then you have services shut down and you completely lose Stuff like you're saying. It's and, this is a, and that is exactly the reason why I always tell people never to buy a Glowforge. <laughs> yes. 100% no, yes. It's, I, I totally get it. Because, like, with the, at first I was like, all right, whatever. Like, what? sure. Okay. Like, internet's going to be an issue. No. What ended up happening was I went there one fucking day. We lost service at the site and we weren't able to connect to it, even though we were on the same freaking network. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay, this is a big pile of shit. Yeah, because it doesn't like have a built in web server. It's just communicating with the cloud API. Yep. And and there's so many more things that are coming out like that, that yeah. the service shuts down and you're completely and utterly screwed. And that's if they don't release their API, everybody's fucked. And that's like a, yeah. that's a, that's a $5,000 freaking laser. Yeah. Like, apparently they did release the API, but just the API. So, yeah, if you don't know how to do that. So, the, so, the so Joe, we're just going to, we're going to just rewrite the back end. Because all, we, but see, but that's one of those things where all you would know is what the API interface is supposed to be. So then yeah. you have to recreate all of the actual code that supports that and does the right things. And yeah. then you can, I mean, which granted it's kind of like talking about the games. People have done that. They're like, okay, I know what it's communicating with. I'm just going to rewrite the game server. Let's go. But, <laughs> and that's basically yeah. what you, you'd have to do. And like, you can't, you can't just like, I've, I will yeah. look into it. Like if you could do like a controller swap on the go for it, not really. No, not easily. No. And the controller is dumb. Like, there's no smarts in it. It's all yeah. streamed from. Hey, at least it's not an M2 Nano. I mean, the M2 Nano does things though. Yeah. Okay, but you have to just you don't send go to this position. You send do twelve steps on the X motor, <laughs> which is so yeah. stupid. <laughs> when I found that out, I was just like, "You've got to be kidding me!" So I. One of the first industrial machines I programmed was like it was a new machine. I went up, walked up to it as it was getting installed, and um, we it was like deburring gears. And this motor came down and it pressed on the gear. And I, he was like, "All right, so for this gear, we we tell it to go down four thousand. And I was like, "What's four thousand? He's like, "Pulses of the motor." And I was oh like, God. What? How is that quantifiable? And he's like, Well, you know, three thousand's like this high and four thousand's like this high. And it's like that doesn't make any reasonable sense. I under I understand what you're doing. I mean, yeah, you can know why? that like you know, like on most printers, depending upon the gearing and all that stuff, that one pulse is ten micron or whatever. But Yeah. But Why? I didn't know that, but it doesn't mean it should be a quantifiable measurement. You know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell Jason that what we need to do for Lightburn 
is make it so that you can have a mode where instead of showing you the work area in millimeters, it shows it to you in motor pulses. That should be your April Fool's release. <laughs> oh, God, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's just like, like you look at the ruler and it's just like all of these freaking numbers and all these tiny dashes because it's like, well, you know, you've got 10, you know, 1,000 pulses per millimeter, so go. <laughs> All right, it probably wouldn't be that for like an actual X axis. Although when I did the the Z the the M five, just all thread screw for the Z axis on my my big plotter, that thing I think it's two thousand pulses or two thousand steps per millimeter. It's really stupid. That sounds about right. Yeah, I used to use M five for lead screws. On it's print. so freaking slow, but it, I mean, it's it only has like thirty millimeters of travel, so I don't really care. Yeah, but. Yeah, I don't think it's it can move fine. faster than five millimeters per second, and that might even be pushing it. <laughs> it's really slow. So anyway, we said all of that. I've been compiling CAD and yes. uh, and CAM, um, and at some point I'm going to release that, and we might do something with it. I don't know. We talked about doing something with it last year. What I'd really like to do is like take all of that and put it into a matrix and then select a couple CAD packages and CAM packages and like do a shootout on them. And cool. it get like an expert level person and like a, a hobby level person, and a complete and utter noob and be like, go make this thing. Uh, how terrible was it? And uh, everybody will have different answers. And the medium level guy was like, it was OK the whole way through. Um, that's that's what it'll be. <laughs> that works. It is always fun seeing software like that, though, where you've got something where it's like it's not really powerful, but a complete noob can do it versus Oh my God, what am I looking at? Yeah. You know, you just I mean, need to know what to look for. That's, that's like, I can't use perfect. Anchorcad. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> like, Try. Yeah. I, I'm having to take a class um, for, for me to use Fusion. Because what it, like the, the problem I had was I did 3D modeling for like VFX and for um like animation and stuff like that so uh, my mind is like wired towards like mesh 3d modeling whereas like parametric 3d modeling is like completely foreign to me and so now i'm having to like go through and learn how to use fusion and it's still frustrating um whereas like tinkercad i put a box in there and i have a box and it works do do either of you remember one two 3d design I do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that that was like my first foray into it. I was really mad when they got rid of it or whatever because it was easy. It wasn't yeah. great, but like I had zero CAD experience when I got a three D printer. I was, you know, as much as I complain about those people, I was one of those people that when I got a three D printer, I had no idea how to make my own stuff. Like, yeah. But I I wanted to learn, and I was like, oh, I'll figure it out. And of course, I went down the route kind of that you are, Joe, where it's like, okay, what's all the options? I tried FreeCAD. I had people suggest Blender. Fuck those people. <laughs> <laughs> Bl Blender is not a CAD studio. It's not. But I will say, modern versions of Blender, are like two point eight, two point nine, the interface is so much better. And probably this was nine years ago. Like it. Up until no. like a year and a half ago, it was horrendous. The 2.8 release, it was like, oh, you made a 3D modeler. Okay. Nice. Like, okay. Yeah. When I tried it, it was it was really terrible. And I, and I know I used some other stuff in between there, I, but I still have a bunch of old designs that are like in the 1, 2, 3D design format that I can't open anymore because I don't think it exists. What I, I think so. you can open them in Tinkercad. Oh, is that what it became? Yeah, I knew it yeah. like became something else. It was like web only or whatever. Uh, well, it, I haven't I haven't used Tinkercad at all. Tinkercad it it had a progression. It was Tinkercad and then one two three D design and then Fusion. And one two three D was always supposed to be that intermediary where you didn't need assemblies, but you needed a little more power than Tinkercad. Uh, and like, uh, gotcha. if you watch, um, like, uh, crap, James. He builds big robots in the UK. Uh, oh, James Bruton. Yes. -robots. Bruton. Yeah. Yeah. Xrobots.uk. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Like all of his early designs were in 1, 2, 3D design. Yeah. Um, I remember that. And that's, I think, how I found it because I was yeah. his stuff. And it was super powerful. And then when they got rid of it, I was really sad. But they rolled a bunch of the functionality into Fusion and right. a bunch of the functionality into Tinkercad. And like, 
they eliminated that middle tier by making like some of them they like, both sides harder i think um yeah, <laughs> yeah fusion definitely yeah. like it's gotten better but i remember when i started because i think i started using it like four or five years ago and like it definitely had a huge hump to get over oh yeah but then once I did, it was fine. Like once I kind of understood, like okay, start with the sketch, go from there, all that stuff. Or at least that's, that's how just, I do it. That's just parametric design in general. That's yeah. Like well, that was the thing. I had no concept of parametric design at all, and I admit I'm still learning. But at least I'm, you know, better than I was. But yeah, there was definitely that. Although it was, I mean, I think partly the part of the reason I jumped onto that too was like every freaking maker on YouTube was using it. So it was there was a lot of tutorials. There was a lot of ways of finding out how to. But then, of course, too, being like very active in the open source world, I had all of my friends yelling at me, gotta use FreeCAD, nothing but FreeCAD, or OpenSCAD, which, like, because, like, you're a programmer, you'll be able to do that. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. I don't, I don't want to have to define a function to make a box. <laughs> like, I <laughs> just don't Aaron care. Was here. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron would uh, have words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like it's fine, and and I get it, and like it, it does make sense for some people. I know some people who are also programmers, and it like makes full sense to them. But like, well, and you can do some incredible things. With oh, totally. That you can't do with yes. parametric models, and like you can kind of get get away with some parametric stuff if you do it right, and you use the like the user variables in Fusion. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of that, but even then I have a lot of times where it's like, Oh, let me just change this one variable. And then all of a sudden the entire design just explodes. And you're like, what did I do? And it was cause something wasn't constrained, right? Cause I usually miss some, you know, I constrained it in two ways, but I didn't constrain it in three ways or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And you know, I do that. So yeah, open SCAD, fantastic for that. I love that there's like, you know, JavaScript versions of it. You can do it in the browser. I've used that. There's a, um, a open SCAD file that you can basically make any pulley in existence, any any yeah. like toothed pulley. I've used I that, use that to make all so the time. many. Yeah, I always pull that out. Like, okay, I need a GT three, HDT five, whatever. Pull that out and use it. Um, I, I need it long. I need a giant. I need like six yeah. I, I, throughout I, it. I want this. <laughs> yeah, I want this to only have twenty teeth, but be five hundred millimeters long. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, and it just does it. It's like sweet. Which yeah, that stuff's great, but. And FreeCAD, the same thing. Like, if if Fusion 360 has a, a hump to get over, FreeCAD's is just like Mount Everest. At least to me, it was really difficult. Uh, it, it does, but it's got some really powerful tools. Like, it it will take an STL and and output it as a step. Uh, like, it has a tool that can do that. It doesn't make it proper. No, like, but it, it does make it so that you could pull a face out and put a hole in it. It's be it's better than converting them like a mesh to a B rep or whatever it is in Fusion. Yeah, and and admittedly, in my experience, it works like when the celestial bodies are aligned just correctly. Because I've had a lot of times where I go to do that, and it's like what it outputs is nothing like what I was expecting it to be, or yeah. it just doesn't recognize it or something like that. I've had, I've definitely had issues with that before. But I've also had it where I've started the script before I went to work and came home from work and the script is like only a 13% done. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's just still running. I did. I did. Like, I found a, a an application the other day that was, it's just like a command line called like STL to step. And I was playing with that because I was trying to, I was trying to convert. This is something for the Hamera hot end build. I was trying to, for what I was trying to figure out the fan duct and I was mad okay. that there was only STLs. And it worked at first and then i was like okay i got this shape i, I have the basic idea i'm going to remodel it so that it doesn't have all the freaking triangles because sometimes i'll do that like make it proper circles and stuff like that and i was i was just going about doing all the outlines and stuff and then i'm like okay now i need to do this hole which i knew was for an m3 screw and i got the center and i drug the circle out and then i was like 320 mil what it was scaled up by a hundred percent or, you know, a hundred times or whatever. Yes. But I didn't, I wasn't looking at any of the scales in fusion. So I didn't notice until I was like 20 minutes into this. And then, yeah. and then I tried to scale that mesh down and fusion just went, no, dude, no, <laughs> no you can't do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was, that, that was fun. You can, sometimes you can do that though, when you import it, you yes. can set the scale and, and, and that's the way to do it. Re-import it and do all that. Yeah. One of the things that annoys me the most with fusion like that, and I know, yeah, now we're getting to fusion is 
that it, at least I've not found a way to, while I'm importing something, go and measure other things. Because sometimes mm. I want to place it in the right place the first time, but like I need to know, okay, this needs to be 3.8 millimeters offset from this particular point. But I can't find that out, so I need to go and find those all out beforehand and know the dimensions of everything. Yeah. It's like, just let yeah. me use the measure tool while I'm using the insert and move tool. That's all I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. That seems heavy. I, I don't know about that. It, they, the, the plan is you, you have construction geometry to allow you to do that. So yeah, like, like you'd have a point in space, 3.8 millimeters from it. What that you're you saying is I'm supposed to plan ahead, ahead, which I you don't are. do. Well, most Especially if you're are. trying to scale them because you're like, I don't know what scale it needs to be yet. Yeah, that's true. I've had that where you import a model. You're like, I literally don't know what scale this is going to be. And you can't find out until you like insert it and say, okay, then find out what scale it is and then do the math to go, okay, I need to make the scale 3.87514492. Yeah. And <laughs> it works. It's always a completely irrational number. Always. Yeah. Deeply. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we've been doing this for a while and, uh, I have no idea if this is going to work, so we should probably stop Yeah. and yeah. output it and, um, uh, post it and then see who complains. Um, yeah. Do you guys have anything else you want to add? I'm good. Can't think of it. I'm good. Okay. Sir. Well, well, if you're listening to this and you've made it all the way through, let us know on Twitter how this sounds. Uh, Cause we probably won't respond to you on anything else right now. I uh, be real honest with you. Um, <laughs> we're super active on Twitter. Not really on anything else. The only people I really talk to me on Facebook are scammers that want us to buy filament and then they'll refund us after we talk about it on the show, which no, we're not going to do that. This or a Nigerian um, Prince Filament scam? No, this is like Sun Lu and you know, uh, like okay. brands that are known for this crap. That I'm so mad at Sun Lu right now with the filament dryer scam, scam that they pulled. Uh, I'm so mad. But does that mean we've made it? Does that mean that like because we're getting these ads, does that mean that we we've made it? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like we have big brands trying to use us for free advertising now, like reaching out to us and, you know, trying to come on forcefully come on the show. Like, like we're going to schedule. A, a, no, you're not going to schedule a thing with us until I could sit here and say that I don't hate what you're selling. Like, I'm just I'm not doing it. Yeah, we're. We're not making enough money off this. We're not making any money off this show. We're not making enough money off this show to sell out. All right. We're just not. <laughs> this whole show is about rallying against working for exposure. If we're going to work for exposure, I'm going to like you. And you're going to yeah. like, I'm going to like the thing that we're exposing. Right. Look, Joe, in this day and age, if you don't have an ad for audible or raid shadow legends, I don't know what you're doing. Or me undies, dude. I would talk <laughs> yeah. audible all day long, and you know it. Like half the yeah. things that Adam and I talk about are audiobooks. Oh, like, totally. Audible. I, if you want to sponsor audible. the show, I am in. As long I, as I get like a credit a month, I'd be down yes. for Audible. And then <laughs> and if actually, I yeah. got if I got sponsored by me undies, and I didn't have to pay for my monthly subscription, I'd be pretty fucking down with that. Because I will tell you, and this is free on the house, because I will tell everybody this. <laughs> fucking MeUndies are really fucking comfortable. I don't know why. I thought it was a complete scam, but it feels like nothing's fucking down there, and it's amazing. <laughs> I I think now, that now, they should, yeah. Now we know about Chris's nether regions. <laughs> wow, that's that's impressive. Brands that will hawk on the show: Audible, Audible, uh, yeah. um, Hop Tea, Hop Tea. If you want to sponsor the show, Hop Tea, yeah. Uh, Me Undies. Who else? Lightburn, uh, Lightburn. You want to hawk? You guys want to sponsor? <laughs> you know I'm down. We don't advertise. You I mean, know Three Floyds. If we got sponsored by Three Floyds, that'd be pretty dope. Most beer companies, New Belgium. I drink yeah. like so much New Belgium. You guys have so much of my money. Um, you know, <laughs> New Belgium actually. That's the funny thing, though, is New Belgium actually does sponsor some podcasts. So maybe we should reach out. Um, 
other companies that I would like to try your products and you could come to be on the show pocket and see I, I want one. I want even for a week. I just want to play. Uh, come be on the show. Uh, and if you guys know people, uh, you know, I don't even care anymore. I'm not. We're just fucking selling out at the end of this fucking <laughs> test. We don't even know if this is going to go out. We're just like, you know what? Like, send us money. Like, send us, send money us toys. Toys and come hang out on the podcast and drink with us and we'll talk about it. And, you know, I can send it back at the end. I don't care. I just want to play around with some stuff. COVID's uh, got me bored, but I'm not bored. I'm not really bored at all. I'm really stressed, no. but like COVID's got me kind of antsy. 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 We do That's projects so that we don't have to think about the rest of the world. Right. Yes. <laughs> For real. Yes. Okay. For reals, uh, this is the end of the podcast. Keep making stuff. All right.